good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, fourth panel uh, in the Spring Seminar 2021. Um, we will have uh, four uh, researchers uh, in this panel. Uh, Marina Galani, uh, Barbara Bergamaschi Novaes, Alice Sanchez, and Inês Nascimento Rodrigues. Um, our first uh, communication will be the one from uh, Marina. Marina Galani is a student of the Masters in Photography at Universidade Católica Portuguesa. Marina has been developing artistic photographic projects for the past three years. Her works range from self-portraiture to street photography, always focusing on subjects related to psychoanalysis and the human psyche. When she lived in Brazil, she took part in a photography study group created and organized by her mentor, Marcelo Greco, a prestigious Brazilian photographer. And in 2020, she had the opportunity to participate in the artistic residency, Our Deserted Times uh, in Amsterdam, led by the Dutch photographer and former professor at Rietveld Academy of Arts, Leo Divendal. Currently, she's a collaborator of Umbigo magazine and is focusing on writing her thesis. Marina. Welcome to the stage. <laughs> so each uh, researcher will have uh, 20 minutes for her uh, presentation. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you said, I'll be starting my talk with the theme, The Driving Silence of Francesca Woodman and Laura Hosps, an analysis of death and self-portraiture. And this research actually started with a comparison, a comparison of both photographers um, understanding that they have several common denominators, including the not only being photographers, but also being women who work with self-portraiture, and even more, um, the use of the, the symbolic weight that photography has in relation to death. And I understood that for me to be able to analyze both photographers, I would have to dive into that subject um, first, and I realized um, during the research that there are several authors who talk about death and photography for many years, and they approach it in several, several different ways um, with a lot of similarities sometimes. And I'll start mentioning <laughs> I'll start mentioning the first one, um, who is Flusser, and he talks about the mysticism of photography, especially related to the apparatus or the black box. Um, so he says that it is precisely the blackness of the box that challenges the photographer. Um, following that, we have Sontag saying that all photographs are memento mori, to take a photograph is to participate in another person's or thing's mortality, vulnerability, mutability. And at last, um, Barthes talking about how the photography, the one I intend, represents that very subtle moment when, to tell the truth, I am neither subject nor object, but a subject who feels he is becoming an object. I then experience a micro version of death, of parenthesis, I am truly becoming a specter. And we can see is, those are just a few of the authors that talk about um, photography and death, and we can see that each of them have a different approach. And because during the, uh, the research, I saw a difference between the, the way that it is said um, the, relation, the relation between death and the photographer, the photographer versus the, the death uh, compared to the object and the subject in photography, uh, we can see again with Flusser that 
the movements of a photographer are comparable to the movements of hunting. For Sontag, the photograph is a sublimated murder, and for Bart, each photograph contains a return of the dead. And to, to help me combine all of that with the research that I was conducting, uh, I went to uh, the first, the sad first um, self-portrait, which was by Hippolyte Bayard, and it was the self-portrait as a drowned man in 1840. He was, uh, he participated in parallel with the Gehen and other scientists um, in the invasion of, photo of photography, but he wasn't recognized by it, and he had um, frustration regarding that. And to, to attest to this, um, to this fact that he wasn't recognized, he uses the, the self-portrait to show him as a dead man, and he, he attaches a text to this self-portrait saying that he died from suicidal, suicidal drowning, and even he uses the darkening of his body extremities as evidence of the decomposition of his body, but the whole act is, we can even consider it uh, almost as a performance because he finishes with a signature on the photo of himself dead, which then we can conclude was a representation. Um, and furthermore, we can say even, according to Komnenu, he invites us to include ourselves in his death. He is still there, he is still decomposing, um, but no one recognizes him, and that, is, that can be said in both ways. He is not recognized as one of the inventors, he is not recognized as a dead man until the observer is there to attest it. Um, because we, as observers of the photograph, are alive, he needs us to say he is actually dead. And as observers, we can go back a little bit to Lacan's uh, mirror stage, and we can say that we are like the adult who shows the image of the child in the mirror to themselves, proving them of their existence, or of their individuality. And in this case, Bayard silenced himself and organized his funeral in a way, um, but, and this is more a poetic approach, uh, he won't be dead until we throw flowers on his coffin, until we attest it. Now taking a step further even, we can say that if to photograph someone is a sublimated murder, according to Sontag, and the object, when frozen in time, symbolically dies, then the self-portrait could be seen as a, a type of suicide. So in the self-portrait, we have a repeated rehearsal of death itself both in the photographic act and in the subsequent observation of the silent self. Um, but not only that, because although these next um, phrases are, or citations are not specific to self-portraiture, they give us insights to understand it a bit more. So again, as Sontag writes, photography can be seen as a form of self-expression, and that can be an acute manifestation of the individualized I, the homeless, private self-astray in an overwhelming world, or a means of finding a place in the world still experienced as overwhelming alien by being able to relate to it with detachment bypassing the interfering, insolent claims of the self. So when we are photographed, we are seen as never before we saw ourselves. Even if we consider the images of a mirror, they're always 
reflected. Um, so the portrait, as well as the tattoo, for example, according to Macedo, is responsible in a way, it is not the only re um, responsible, but it is responsible for the bordering of the subject, the creation of the identity, just as much as the mirror. And it is through, and it's through it that we identify ourselves. We become all image, um, death in person, according to Barthes. We remain silent. We are expropriated of ourselves, and we are available for all kinds of readings, especially if we consider um, a photograph that has been printed or developed, we become we turn into a symbolic and a physical object. And we then let ourselves be handled, torn, forgotten, affected by the action of time. And now um, realizing all of that and the relationship between death and portraiture and self-portraiture, we can start talking about the first one, which is Francesca Woodman. Um, I think most people at least know about her, but either way, uh, she was born in 1958 in the United States and was the daughter of two artists. She came into contact with photography at the age of 13 after winning a camera from her father. And at the time, she also took photography classes. In 1975, she started her studies at Rhode Island School of Design. And there, it just at 17, she devoted her time entirely to photography. She was known for being dedicated, but she did have depressive tendencies, which were um, in a few texts and interviews um, denied by some critics and close um, friends, but it was confirmed by her, her mother. And this was only intensified over the years because she wasn't, a, wasn't truly accepted in the arts community. She lost several art grants and she had troubled relationships. Um, shortly after her first publication at the age of 22, she unfortunately committed suicide by jumping from a building in New York. Her legacy is definitive for contemporary photography and she was considered a prodigy by many she defied the limits of self-portraiture, introducing psychological, macabre, and surreal themes. She was inspired by Man Ray and Claude Cahun. It was placed among the feminist body artists of the 70s. These are just um, some images that I selected for those who don't know her work. Um, as you can see, she she uses the self-portraiture um, in relation to death and to surrealist, surrealistic um, themes. And now we are gonna see one of the women which she inspired, which was Laura Hosps. Laura is a Dutch photographer born in 1994 who has been conquering her space in great European galleries. She started her photography career at just 16 years old, graduated with honors at the Amsterdam Photo Academy, and was awarded an emergency, Emerging Talent Award Lens Culture in 2015. Among the awards and scholarships she won are Jacob Ries Documentary Award, Young Masters Art Prize, Zilferhen Camera, and Prix de la Photographie. According to her, the main theme of her work is self-portraiture due to the need to connect with people, to deal with what happens within herself, and to process the many difficulties of her life. So um, unlike we saw with Francesca, she is very open about her own struggles, and she shows that in her photography. Um, as a young woman with eating disorders, depression, and anxiety, her first published book, UCP, reveals a little of her routine in the psychiatric hospital where she was admitted. With strong melancholy and morbid image, she invites the observer to plunge into their own obscurity 
And these are the images that I selected of her. And as I said, she's quite um, open and she exposes um, her struggles with mental illnesses. And you can see from the picture in the middle, for instance, the self-mutilation, um, which is something that didn't appear in Francesca or appeared in a more symbolic way. And now, specifically with the, both images that I selected to compare, they have similarities, especially in form, but also if we interpret them as portraying um, angelic figures, we can see that they, that they also correlate a lot. And talking a little bit more about each image, we, say, we can say that the first one is part of Francesca's series entitled Angels. It was done mostly during the period that she lived in Italy, when she had contact with statues and sculptures of humanized angels due to the effects of gravity, volume, weight, and suspension. And this contact would then have inspired her to explore the temporal suspension enacted in the photographic act, an idea also discussed by Barthes with the noema that has been. Main categorizer of the presence and subsequent symbolic absence of the referent in the photograph. Um, Laura's image is part of her project, Inconvenient Bodies, in which she explores the beauty of the female body in positions not normally portrayed in the arts. And we find ourselves even wondering what type of action is being taken. So is she jumping, um, jumping forward? She's in the middle of a fall. Is she, which I, I believe is the intent, um, flying as an angel? And with little space in the image, it is clear that the focus is on the movement and the symbolic value of the movement and the, the fabric, which would be considered the, the wings. It could be um, taking a step too far to say that it would be interesting to question whether the portraits of her scars and her disappearance were not symbolic and complementary forms of another self-mutilation. And we could take this step too far because we can stop to analyze her story, and not only hers, but also Laura's, um, their stories, their photography work, and the relation that that could have with the death drive, which is a concept. It's the concept that Pereira explains um, as representing the ineffable, the unreachable, the indefinable. Death drive is on the side of what is inaccessible to knowledge without being ensnared by eros. It becomes unspeakable and therefore changes silently. It is the rest that is silence. And again, the matter of silence, which we can also relate to death, like the, the, the silent. Um, now, um, according to Freud specifically, it is a compulsion to repeat that recalls past experience that do not include any possibility of pleasure and then never, even for a long time, brought satisfaction, either for, even for instinctual impulses that have since been repressed. It is a destructive and self-destructive tendency related to masochism and which aims to bring what is alive to extinction. It would be like a return to the subject's previous state, to the state of non-life. And we can um, see that in their work because it is the desire in their work, it is the desire to become an object and more than that, to portray themselves in the state of suspension, of absence, of dematerialization. We can see that not only with the use of the angelic figure, but just um, the, 
the figure itself as not being completely still, as being something disappearing. And we have the feeling that by watching their images fade, we are actually watching and attesting to their death. So again, with Bayard, and again, a bit more of a poetic approach, uh, woodmen and hosps just need us to throw flo flowers on their coffins. Um, they need us to attest to their disappearance, to their death. And however, when we think about that work and the, the works that they do as self-portraitures, uh, we see that uh, they themselves as photographers, objects, observers, they are the three things, repeat this symbolic death almost in a sadomasochistic act of compulsion with the repeated self-portraits. Um, it is in this repetition that they find the main point of their death drive. And the, the matter of them portraying themselves as angels in my opinion, just gives another layer of meaning, of symbolic meaning to this um, connection with death drive, because although angels have been portrayed in the arts for a long time, they were only associated with melancholy personalities in 1514, after the engraving by Albrecht Dürer on the subject. So his angel appears seated, um, tired, and fed up, not out of laziness, but out of frustration of being attached to the mundane while his ideas belong to the celestial. And now to conclude, um, we saw through Laura and Francesca that as an instrument of the death drive, photography can, be, can contribute to the compulsion for repetition it can gain uh, silencing power, especially when we think about Francesca, who ended up committing suicide, and suspend what we still have. So let us, and this is another, a bit more of a poetic um, view, let us therefore be cautious and begin to choose wisely the grave in which we will throw our flowers. And that's it, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Marina, for a very interesting uh, presentation. We will now move on to um, Barbara Bergamaschi's uh, presentation titled uh, Peter Cherkaski's Cinematic Ontology. Um, Barbara uh, is an Italian-Brazilian filmmaker uh, and researcher. She holds a master's degree in performing arts uh, uh, by, uh, from University of Rio de Janeiro and a bachelor degree in social communications, uh, also by University of Rio de Janeiro. In 2012, she studied cinema at the uh, University of Paris 8, Saint-Denis, France, as part of an, an international exchange program. She was a professor at the Theatre Studies Department at Federal University of saint jean del rey uh, during one academic year. And she's now concluding her PhD doctoral thesis focused on experimental cinema and found footage at PPGCOM UFRG, Uni uh, in Universidad Federal de Rio de Janeiro, um, and PUC Rio. Recently, she was granted a CAP Sprint scholarship to study at CITAR as a visiting researcher uh, in the Universidad Católica Portuguesa at Porto, where she currently uh, lives. Barbara, thank you very much for being here. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I would like to thank you, the organization of the seminar, for accepting my, my communication. So I'm here to, to talk about Peter Tchaikovsky, Cinematic Ontology. Um, I will show some excerpts of, the, of his films, and I will read the, the presentation also. So, um, the Austrian experimental filmmaker Peter Tchaikovsky started making his films in the year of 1979 uh, with a filmography composed of around 30 works. The following stand out, Coming Attractions, which won uh, an award at the 67th Venice Film Festival, Enduring Work, 
that won the grand prize at Oberhausen Film Festival. He's one of the most renowned and awarded experimental filmmaker and activity. Uh, I've heard he will premiere a new movie this year in a big uh, grand festival. Um, so to begin, I brought two citations of him. Uh, I think these two quotes, can we can start to underline the concerns that haunt the director and permeate his filmography. I will um, read for you. Perhaps one could say that from the outset, I wanted to unreveal and dissolve the medium. Destroy it's not the right expression, but yes, some type of breaking, and in breaking, allowing something to become visible. I wanted to hurl and appropriate, in other words, untamed response at this attempted domestication, which is the rule of commercial film production. So, a second one. Whether we like it or not, we are currently witnessing in the cinematographic domain a progressive dissolution of classic materiality by the techniques of digital reproduction of images. If historical evolution leads in the long run to the point where the industry is subject to the laws of the market, we will abandon the production of analog material. This would be an unprecedented event in history. We would see for the first time the industry suppress the medium that allow it to reach its full bloom. So um, in these two quotes, I think we can see um, the main concerns of the filmmaker. Uh, he, he's marked, uh, his films are marked notably by the reappropriation and the creative deconstruction of found footage. Found footage are, uh, they can be Hollywood old classics, low budget amateur trash B films, pornographic films, old publicity, and he uses also consecrated European avant-garde works. So uh, he works with many sources of uh, different archive. Um, and he has a, an iconoclastic archaeologist, Tcherkaksky, sorry, is an iconoclastic archaeologist that seek his inspirations by excavating, literally, because sometimes he, he uh, uh, breaks and manually scratch, yeah, the, the films, the arc of images. He, his work operates where the archive fails to fulfill its original archerontical, that's a Derridaian vocabulary function, where the information is missing or present itself as a ruin, as an expectra of what was once its pristine original form. And we can also see that he's pursued by an old ghost, um, that's the death of cinema, uh, that's an everlasting menace that exists since the birth of cinema, as Thomas Alcester has said, we know that uh, the Lumiere brothers thought that cinema wouldn't, that wouldn't have a future or a commercial success, so cinema was born with his death, uh, right, its death right ahead. So Tcherkaksky creates his films orientated by this imminent end of cinema, either uh, a classical commercial narrative cinema, which he deliberately attack. Uh, he, he, he wants to, in a certain way, kill this, this um, conventional cinema, uh, and either his analog punk alternative model of production in verge of obsolescence, because he just used analog films. Um, his films lies in this linear ambiguity between eros and tenetus, between phantom and fantasy, words that share the same etymology, according to the psychoanalysis theory, in particular Lacan, uh, fantasma, fantasy, uh, phantom, uh, the, the erotical fantasy, and um, uh, it can be seen as a, uh, as a ghost. Um, he simultaneously desires and fears the end of cinema, creating an erotical cinematography in a battalion sense uh, that I quote, uh, er erotism, a sense to life even in death. So it's a, this is the, um, I, I will talk about a movie called Alter Space, a film comp that composed the famous CinemaScope trilogy alongside La Riven DreamWorks, in which he reappropriates the image of a horror movie, thriller, uh, The Entity, by Sidney J. Ferry, um, that was um, screened in 1983. Alongside the analysis of the film, I will identify some traces and echoes of avant-garde ghosts that still live in Tchaikovsky works in particular surrealism. Um, but just as a, a brief 
remark and observation before, uh, before, uh, before entering the analysis. Uh, in order to introduce the team, I should make a, a previous remark on the concept of ontology. It's a ontology, it's a, a, a neologism, a term derived from the idea developed by Jacques Derrida in his book, The Spectres of Marx, uh, that unites the French words hunt, to hunt, and ontology. Uh, ontology. This homo homonomy or homophony here is used to refer to the persist persistence of elements of the past that returns in the forms of a ghost. So I, this is uh, what I'm researching in my thesis, in my investigation, uh, how he re-elaborates the ontology of cinema. Um, in order to, um, blah, blah, blah. okay, continuing. Mark Fisher re-appropriated the Derrida term to criticize pastiche, anachronism, eclecticism, kitsch, retro, and cultural products, and especially TV series and contemporary music, expanding Frederick Jameson's postmodernity critic. Ontology would be proper to the time of techno tele, tele discursivity, techno tele iconicity, simulacra, and synthetic images. But I, um, I'm proposing a, a new type of appropriation of the, the term, um, not in a negative, regressive nostalgia to see the Tchaikovsky films not as a captured by the capitalist interest of the area of simulacrum, but rather as a positive inflection, what Mel uh, Walter Benjamin would call a sublime melancholia, uh, melancholia ira eroica in Latin, that on the opposite act as a political performative of res resistance to the market dominance. So I, I, I elaborate this, this chart that I take the risk of uh, rending the complexity of the subject into a too schematical way, but um, I try to designate here what I regard as cinematic ontology and what is it is responding to, or what so sort of ontological ghosts uh, Tchaikovsky is trying to run away uh, from. So, for example, the real, uh, the ontological Bazanian idea that the image is uh, uh, re related to indexality, real, uh, then cinema must be dramatic. Uh, well, uh, I won't be able to to go um, profoundly on this, but that's uh, the, the my thesis now that I'm going at. And I elaborate this concept of necropoetics in the contemporary, but we can go on ahead. Uh, so to think Tchaikovsky works, I'm more interested in Hal Foster's thesis on new avant-garde, in which he analyzed uh, art under the Freudian analogy of deferred action, or as posteriori effect in, in German, it's Nestraglichkeit. Uh, for Freud, especially when read by Lacan, at least two traumas are uh, needed to make one trauma. In other words, an event would only be recorded through another one that decodes it. So avant-garde work from the 1910s and the 1920s was never fully significant in their time, in their present appearance, because they were an empty void in the order of the symbolic. In this way, the proposition of, of avant-garde will only be realized now um, in the 60s and in, in the 70s, con uh, new avant-garde, or in contemporary artists such as Tchaikovsky. The, con the contemporary would be then a kind of meta-modernity or auto-modernity, other notion of history, rather than a progressive teleological uh, line uh, of time, right? Um, well, but shall see finally the film. Um, and I'll stress out a few examples of this um, uh, return of the signif resignified that he does. So. Where is the movie? Oh, okay. <laughs> Ai, meu Deus, nove cinquenta. Pronto. Well, so. In the film Outer Space, Tcherkovsky reuses the feature horror film, The Entity, that you're seeing on the screen, by Sidney J. Ferry, starring Barbara Hershey in the role of a woman 
who lives alone in a house hunted by an invisible diabolical entity. The film was a box office bomb. Uh, it's a really bad film, bad horror movie. <laughs> the screenplay is based on a real event, uh, the Doris Bitzer case, documented by the UCLA Psychological Department in 1974, that uh, this woman, she claimed she had been repeatedly sexually assaulted by an invisible entity that lives in, lived in her house. The original film, like most horror genre, explores sexual images with grotesque acts of violence. What keeps the narrative thread is the question whether what is happening is real, is in fact a supernatural being chasing the woman, or it is indeed a psychotic or hysterical uh, delusion of the protagonist who is hunted by her childhood drama, trauma. She has a childhood traumas of abuse. Um, so this thing, I chose this thing because Tchaikovsky will use a lot this, this particular excerpt in his movie. Okay. And now I'll show the reappropriation. Mm. So, um, the motto of the original plot, in a certain way, remains in the re reinterpretation of the Austrian filmmaker, but the horror is now inflicted in the subject matter. Tcherkaksky uses an unique and impressive technique of contact printing, by which the found fo film footage is copied by hand and frame by frame onto unexposed film stock, creating a species of overlapping palimpsests with the help of small laser lanterns, performing a manual handcraft new print. In that way, all structural elements are revealed, such as the sprockets and soundtracks, thus allowing us to see the support and the medium itself. The body of the image is also assaulted, exposing its skeleton, flesh, and viscera. Terror now happens in an extra geodetical level, in plastic terms, and no longer just in the narrative or in the drama. So it's uh, exactly the same scene we saw. So the film progressively uh, destroy itself, so like in this uh, auto-suicidal... Well, let's continue. How can I come back to the PowerPoint? Oh, thank you. Um, to many film researchers, in particular, experimental found footage cinema specialists such as William C. Wies, Nicole Brenet, and Jamie Barron. What distinguished found footage from compilation documentary or, or journalist archival films or postmodernist remix and sampling is the use of college as a discursive tool. College would be the quintessential art, art form. Um, sorry, I got lost. Mm -hmm. da, da, da. College would be the quintessential art and technique used to question the traditional premises of representative nature, having been the main modernist weapon for assaulting or putting in check the realism of images. Found footage would then necessarily have a self-referentiality, a spectral quality that would encourage a critical and ironical analysis of the history of the medium, and the original material now displaced from its original locus, only mainly through dialectical montage. So here there's an example of Peter Tchaikovsky. It's clearly uh, making a reference uh, in coming attractions to Picasso analytical cubism. Um, Nicole Brenet will also state that the um, early Dadaist movies already um, had a, were a premonition of what found footage would do. Uh, she uh, gets this citation of Fernand Leger, that's the screenwriter of the Dada film Bala Mechanique by Murray, when he says, employ discarded take it, takes from any movie without choosing at random. That would be like, for example, Ken Jacobs, the perfect film that he would use the, um, by chance, he find this uh, movie in the garbage, and there is also this element of luck in found footage genre, right? So, 
uh, now talking about the surrealist heritage in Tcherkaksky, uh, the priority lab laboratory where, um, sorry, I read the, the wrong part, Eliane Robert Moraes points out that the privileged operation of surreal imagination consisted of the approximation of distant realities. The games of liberating the surrealist unconscious took place primarily through language, to later extend from the words to body, creating an axis between writing, dismemberment, and beheading. Contrary to the rationality of academic art, the surrealist gesture operated in the sense of dehumanizing anatomy, subjecting the body to unrestrained senses and disorder. For this reason, the importance of the image of the dissection table and the metamorphosis of Shant de Molderor by Lutremont, that's a book, uh, as a central reference for praxis and surrealist ideas. This one here is the motto of the surrealist uh, of convulsive beauty. That's a phrase taken from the uh, Chants de Molderor, uh, as beautiful as the chance encounter of a sewing machine and an umbrella on an operating table. This would be the concept of beauty for the surrealist. Um, so here's another example of a citation of um, Le Tremont, that's a black a, a, a joke made by Man Ray, in which he gets all these objects here and he wraps them in this package and uh, entitled The Enigma of Isadore Ducasse. Isadore Ducasse is the name, the real name of Le Tremont. But this already shows the approximation and college of distinct objects. Uh, and to get to Tchaikovsky here, we can see there is a other clear citation, uh, his film Exquisite Corpus. Uh, it's a citation for the praxis of cadaver skis that was made by surrealists. Uh, they, this example here at, at the right was done by Man Ray, Max Maurice, André Breton, and Yves Tanguy. They draw with eight hands, each one of them a strip part of uh, th there are four strips here of paper, and each one of them draw a part. And Tchaikovsky does the same um, method. He strips the film in three like strings, and it, this film is made only with a pornographical old uh, archive. And he creates a new bodily monstrous um, that has no organization. And also, another Tchaikovsky citation. In DreamWorks, he used this pin needle that, who, who knows, the La Retour à la Raison identifies that, that he is making a, a quotation to Man Ray. And now, um, getting to the question of the, the question of the woman depiction. Um, the priority laboratory where this defigurement games will be put into practice will be precisely the woman's body. For surrealist artists, disorder, chaos, and the dissolution of forms occur precisely in the sexual act. When portraying the woman's body in, as an incomplete or absent way, the surrealists reveal their phantom and phantasmatic condition, returning the object of desire to its virtual origin, enhancing its imaginary potential. In this way, for the surrealists, Woman and erotism would liberate men from the repressive hypocritical rationality and moralism of the bourgeoisies. Uh, we can uh, uh, contest some of their ideas of femininity nowadays, but um, they were trying right, to, to break something. Um, for Walter Benjamin, I'm finishing. Um, for Walter Benjamin, the ways in which capitalism explores cinemas takes place mainly through the female body and the cult of celebrities. For the philosopher, cinema can be revolutionary, but also reveal enormous amounts of grotesque episodes that are consumed in cinema and constitute an impressive index of the dangers that threaten humanity, resulting from the repressions that civilization brings with it and would have the capacity to reveal an optical unconscious in the same way as Freud unconscious. Um, it is curious in this context to recall the etymological origin of the word museum. The word derives from the Greek museum, which means proper to muses and refers to the temple where muses reside, deities of Greek mythology that inspires all forms of art. Taking this debate to the fields of cinema, Antoine de Bayek will conceptualize what he designates as cinematographic erotomania or the childhood disease of dark rooms 
The author draws attention to the fact that the love of cinema or the cinephilia was largely germinated in the soil of the desire for the cinematographic woman or muse. As Laura Mulvey will say in her seminal feminist essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema, films have always been made uh, directed to the male gaze. Muses in cinema would thus incarnate the fetishism of modern society, like everything that slips into the field of the sacred and the religious. This woman have become the object of both idolatry and horror, incorporating both beauty and feminine monstrosity. So, um, last part of the movie. Outer space is an example of formal suicidal battle fought not only against the rules of Aristotelian poetic regime, but also the implosion of any and all figurative representation of the image as a provocation to the classical ontology and the Bazanian idea of cinema as a window or mirror of the world. In Tchaikovsky new montage, the real monster seems to be the camera. It is ultimately the thriller commercial cinema itself that carries within it the voyeuristic coscopophilic regime intrinsically invasive that literally violates the actress of the film in an excessive exploration of her body as a commodity for sale. In a way, it is as if the female figure had incorporated the invading entity to such an extent that it finally became the metonymy, metonymy for the very condition of the cinematographic image. In this reinterpretation, the director now takes revenge for the violence perpetrated against women in the original film returning the same violence to the medium that produced it. The spell therefore turns against the sorcerer. In Tchaikovsky films, we witness the double operation of destruction and reincarnation of the cinema muse that serves as a metaphor for the museum and the mausoleum of time, cryptics of classical cinema and representation, which never tires of being reborn and resignifying even in under the sign of chaos. That's it. Okay, thank you, Barbara, for uh, another very interesting presentation on uh, Tcherkovsky's work. Uh, we'll now move on to the next uh, presentation by uh, Alice Sanchez, uh, titled There Are Horses in Chernobyl Notes for on uh, New Aesthetics of Horror. Alice uh, is, uh, graduated, uh, has graduated in Communication Sciences at uh, Universidade Nova, Faculdade de Ciências Sociais e Humanas, and is currently a first-year master's student in Communication Sciences on Contemporary Culture and New Technologies at the same university. Her fields of interest include aesthetics and art theory, the connections between techniques, aesthetics, and politics, visual culture, epistemology, history of ideas, and history of science. Science. She has just finished the science communication internship in the ERC-funded CUHCT uh, project, Router, Making the Earth Global, Early Modern Routers, and the Construction of a Global Concept of the Earth. Elise, thank you for being with us whenever you want. Is this? Yeah, okay, it's working. Uh, I just wanted first to thank everyone for organizing this and for accepting my paper. And uh, is the volume high enough? Am I speaking loudly enough? Okay. Um, and uh, this uh, this is basically <laughs> this talk is basically the result of a semester investigating uh, posthumanism and techniques and aesthetics, and uh, it's it's probably going to sound a little maybe a little strange, maybe a little harsh, maybe a little uh, impious, but <laughs> uh, hopefully you'll understand what my point is with this kind of strange title. Okay, so as I was saying, this talk has a strange title, and uh, hopefully by the end the bad joke will become slightly clearer. What I'm proposing with this short trip to the ruins of Chernobyl is a sort of diagnosis of a certain contemporary relationship with the technological landscape 
or Technics, if you prefer, and the way it inspires awe and terror. The 35th anniversary of the disaster was just a few days ago, um, and the world was once again reminded of the sacrifice that so many workers had to make to contain the effects of the accident and the trauma so many people continue to endure because of the effects that could not be contained. This could be a point of entry for a discussion on ghosts and memory. However, you'll have to excuse the impiety of not going that way and instead choosing to approach it from the perspective of so-called outsiders, even though no one really is an outsider when it comes to potential nuclear accidents. In this situation, though, uh, the fan of dark tourism or the internet dweller who comes across pictures of the elephant's foot cannot be said to share the same sort of traumatic memory as the people evacuated from the now ghost town of Pripyat on that day. Yet it is with that different, somewhat more detached experience that we will be dealing with here. Ruin porn is the new sublime. That is the curious catchphrase that opens a 2018 book by Siobhan Lyons called Ruin Porn and the Obsession with Decay. The use of the term porn seems to imply that there is a cultural form of addictive consumption of images of decadence, focused particularly on sites that should not be ruins. The city of Detroit is one of the main examples mentioned in the book, and such contemporary living dead landscapes stand not as ruins of a distant time, but as ruins of some part of our own social, cultural, and technological project. Chernobyl in Pripyat, and I should point out, I will be referring to Chernobyl without much concern for differences between specific sites or between being there and seeing the ruins through pictures because that would require a whole new talk to dissect and differentiate. Um, both of these cities uh, are also part of this uh, obsession with ruin porn. And if we consider just tourism in 2018 alone, the Ukrainian government reported 72,000 visitors to Chernobyl as in a tourist form, let's say. The suggestion that there is a need to think about a new sublime emerging from new types of places and possibly generating new forms of affects is important. The ruin inspires fascination and terror and ours isn't the first century to be inclined towards the aesthetics of ruins as the locations of the Gothic make clear. Uh, the degradation of the medieval castle or monastery by sins and specters of various kinds, the settings themselves physically decayed, is a trope of the genre. A number of new ways to make the dead roam the earth emerged in the 19th century by means of new technical devices, devices that promise new possibilities of visibility for the very small and for the no longer present, but that in the process also multiplied the possibilities for imagining the invisible. The Gothic and its ruins mobilized the feeling of there being something inside the house that shouldn't be there, with house being understood also metaphorically as the order we inhabit. Here, the ruins can be said to bring forth the uncanny. However, this is not the kind of sublime Lyons is referring to. I find China Mieville's formulation more useful to move forward from here. We, the residents of modernity, live in an unquiet house. With modernity being taken in the text to refer to something closer to the contemporary, so you kind of have to excuse that or at least consider that in the reading of this sentence, there is a dislocation of the focus of the haunting from something that happens inside the house to something that is part of the very order it creates. As Mark Fisher puts it, the focus on the uncanny as the aesthetic effect or motive of, the, of horror is symptomatic of a secular retreat from the outside that obscures other aesthetic categories. The ruins of Chernobyl are not so much uncanny as they are eerie, operating not a profane revelation, but an unsettling withdrawal of total visibility and full understanding. 
I am working with the very Benjaminian framework of a reconfiguration of modes of perception by the technological texture of a certain time and space. Technics as the relationship between nature and history shows and hides, creates light and specters. Benjamin used the concept of Robertson's phantasmagoria to envision the way in the 19th century projection, uh, projections of the invisible roamed amongst life, with this invisible being strongly associated with the new forms of industrial capitalism. But it is curious to observe how the description of a contemporary of such optical device um, merci. applies to the point I am trying to make. I would rather see hell than total destruction. Demons frighten me less than the mute horror of the naked abyss. Seeing specters is less frightening than ubiquitous yet indescribable threat. Moving back to contemporary times, certain characterizations of our techno-aesthetical landscape, like that of Paul Virilio, have emphasized total visibility a generalized exhibition of every source of horror, disfigurement, death, destruction, that makes us permanent spectators and anxious anticipators of when our time will come. Planetary technics is also, in this account, something like a planetary freak show, killing spectrality in favor of objection. This is perhaps a little too optimistic. We live in an unquiet house, a house that is not fully under control and the walls that keep the, the outside out don't seem quite as strong as they once did. In the words of Eugene Thacker, the world is increasingly unthinkable, and the expansion of the realm of potential visibility does not mean total revelation. We don't control everything that is produced, and we can't apprehend everything that is produced. Something always eerily seeps into our chaos-confronting order. Virilio tells us that what is terrifying in the world is a sort of body horror, a total exhibition of our gruesome fate by way of permanent exposition through media to the path of inevitable and brutal destruction. But maybe it, it would be more prudent to think that yet something remains hidden. Chernobyl is a complex kind of ruin. It is an aggregate of abandoned buildings that nature and time are slowly reclaiming back, leaving behind a trace of a civilizational project and where scenes of a city's life that no longer exists remain registered. In that sense, it is profoundly uncanny. But through it also runs another relationship between history and nature that I have been discussing. It is also the product of a disaster a technical disaster made possible by a set of conditions, among which is the radioactive nature of the uranium in the reactor's core. The relationship between this stored power and human needs, a certain social structure, scientific constructs, machines. It is in the coexistence of these forms of ruin that lies the eerie nature of Chernobyl, the visible and the invisible, the human and the not quite human. Chernobyl was part of a certain way of projecting and building the world for us, to use Eugene Thacker's formulation, a techno-political and economic feature of an order. Nuclear power is a controlled way of extracting from nature to achieve human goals. But this extraction is based on the features of nature that we have learned to use productively to a certain end. This technical landscape that makes up our relationship with nature and that structures the world for us does not, however, exhaust the potential of nature, which remains part of the world in itself. Once again, Thacker's formulation. Reading Virilio, we could diagnose that the extension of our techniques to the structure of a global machine creates an emptying of the realm of the invisible by means of total manipulability and manipulation of the real. The interplay of human will to extract and thereby maintain a certain order and the world, however, does not exhaust or necessarily illuminate every connection between humans and humans, humans and things, and between things themselves. The concept of the unheimlich, the unhomely, the uncanny, doesn't quite shine as much light on a specific dimension of the aesthetic affections generated by contemporary techniques as it should 
maybe because it has, as Fisher puts it, been subsuming in itself other forms of dreadful affection. Psychoanalysis itself, and the fact that the concept of the uncanny was proposed by Freud, is not trivial, has a strong bond with this way of exploring the obscured corners of the room. But it can be said that Lacan somewhat subverted this by thinking about techniques as a necessary part of the architecture of this house, making it unhomely in that sense from the very beginning. The introduction of this consideration for the outside of the human as something in its own right through the concept of the Yuri seems necessary. We are permanently caught up in the rhythms, pulsions, and patternings of non-human forces, as Fisher says. Spectres are linked to control, and they remain as the unseen in every order that attempts to organize around total visibility and total disposition. Mastery of the techno-scientific structure required to build a nuclear power plant does not mean mastery of nuclear efficient over reactions of materials over malfunctions. It also does not mean independence from a number of political and economic considerations. And it does not mean that every single worker in the plant knows and has mastery over the totality of the connections involved. The fantasy of a global consciousness and alertness to the consequences of our contemporary technical landscape ignores that to bring a couple of interesting descriptions previously mentioned. The world is increasingly unthinkable, and ours is an unquiet house. The eerie comes about as a mode of aesthetic affection that invokes otherness and disturbance from the outside of the human, that attributes it a certain autonomy and a certain degree of necessary cautions towards narratives of completely designed machinery. There are horses in Chernobyl, is something of an image meant to unsettle a bit by highlighting the lack of control we have over what appears in the world, over what is produced, over the chaotic connections that make our house unquiet. How can these creatures survive there? What kind of deep genetic reconfigurations are happening in this species, if there are any, that allow it to live in a heavily radioactive environment? What is cooking up in those forests in adaptation to our failure? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Thank, thank you so much for all your presentations and for the, the work that's behind putting them all together. Well done. For me, it was interesting to see how the work of Barbara somehow like provides the contextual, no, an image of the contextual, cultural context of Marina's presentation, particularly in respect of the teenage years of the 70s and 1970s revival and also all how all of how all of this is also somehow in the back of Alice Sanchez's presentation and the way that Ines gave a beautiful open up the project I mean not a beautiful project but a beautiful presentation of the way of the project that had opened up also the techno scientific roots that have led to several catastrophes, namely also the Chernobyl. The reason why I wanted to make questions is because I was one of the tourists of Chernobyl. To enter in Chernobyl, that's the only protocol unless you are actually a guardian. There's many people walking around the area from botanists to other kind of researchers. I was one of the researchers. And the status of tourism is just to control and to because you have to sign a certain kind of code to be to be there. So it's purely protocolar and only way I think that you can enter the zone. But being there, it felt at odds with what we 
storytell, no? In a way, this is also present in all your presentations, no? This kind of ghost that gets inscribed in all our media, photographies, film, books. And so, the reality in Chernobyl is particularly at odds with the cultural construction of the reality of Chernobyl. Inside the zone, curiously, the levels of radioactivity are not, are, are not as high. Actually, in England, London, they are a bit higher than inside the zone. So we are actually all, you know, we all live the same house, but we are also tourists of the same radioactive catastrophe. But I really, you know, in, uh, in, is not, not so sure engaged with your work, but I really, I really liked a lot the things you were saying, and I would like to pose you this question. Because fe it felt like a little bit, no, like this kind of rage of the haunting house. And um, uh, I forgot the question I wanted to put. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it makes, maybe I'll remember and it still as a comment. Thank you. I, I don't know if you want to comment, Alicia. Uh, I can I can uh, make a slight comment. Of course, I, I did not go to Chernobyl to make this uh, presentation. I and Chernobyl is obviously something of. Um, I used it more as a, I suppose an image than anything else. I guess uh, it was more. It was more, I, my point was a lot more about a certain um, change in the uh, techno-aesthetical relationship we have towards horror and how, uh, and how those things, um, how the possibilities we have for making things technically have an impact and have, an, change the way we perceive things aesthetically, I suppose. And um, how continuing to look at pictures that uh, are meant to be frightening or meant to be scary in some way, or that we perceive as supposedly scary for some reason. Uh, I suppose my question was more towards the fact that why do we consider this uh, why, why is there, uh, why, why are there video games set in Chernobyl? Why is it, um, why is the aesthetics of the nuclear fallout such a, why, why is it, why is there a rage around this, uh, this, this thing? Why, what, con what kind of effects does this cause in our, perception of what is scary, of what is terrifying, of what... So it wasn't... Uh, I, I can understand that maybe it, it sounded a little um, detached from what the actual experience of being there might be, precisely because that there was no... There was no such experience involved in the making of this. It was very speculative in that way. Exactly, but that, that's, that's precisely the point. There is life there. Uh, that's the fascinating thing. It's, we don't control everything. That's precisely the point. Thank you. Uh, just before moving to another question here, let me go to the Q&A in Zoom because we have one question that was posed by uh, Miriam Sampayu. And this is a question for Barbara uh, Bergamaschi. A great presentation. I'm quoting uh, Miriam. Can you speak more of Peter's process slash way of working with photochemical film, its tactility? I appreciate your theoretical outlook. Peter works specifically with light and with the films physic physically. Uh, slash materiality. Today in digital age, many people do not know about the process of photochemical film. The cameras are lacking his process, especially important as well. Thank you so much for your presentation. Hi, um, thank you for the question. So, um, 
I will try to describe the process. Uh, I've read many Cherkaksky interviews, um, but he does a process that it's really similar to um, college, as I, I said on the, the PowerPoint. He get like, for example, in this one, outer space, as I, I understand, right? I never see, saw him doing it, but uh, that's how I understand he does it. He gets a virgin uh, pellic, uh, film um, um, with no emotion and project with a 16 millimeter, the original movie, and with a um, um, laser pen, he does like a, it's like a stamp on the virgin film and does a, like a five, six, seven layers of the same projecting and four different stripes. It's kind of difficult to, to, to explain the process, but it's mainly manual and art artisanal. And I think that maybe there's a generation that doesn't uh, even understand that or never had experience of uh, seeing uh, an analog laboratory and film chemicals. But uh, Tchaikovsky, he, he strains that it's a really different, um, it's like using oil paint or using um, aquarella. It's a different, um, it's a different metaphysical uh, regards to the material, and it's it's not the same. It's not the same as digital. He he would say it's a different. The the way you make the movie will influence the process in the end, the 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 final um, result. So he he claims that we can't lose this type of experience with the film. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I think it would be better for the, the Tchaikovsky himself explain it. I'm trying my best, but it's kind of difficult without any uh, image or to, to, to give some support for what I'm saying, but I, I don't know if I answered the question, but the, I can, after all, give the citations of the interview if she, she wants it to, for her to read. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that would be great and is very generous. Um, okay, I will now pass to uh, Carlos, who had one question, and then to here. Well, it's just uh, uh, one is half a question, more. Uh, I was. Um, I was uh, thinking of listening to Barbara, if uh, she would know that, uh, maybe she already know, but if you don't, you, have to, you stay with the reference. There's this uh, Australian um, uh, film critic called Adrian Martin. He has his uh, essay, do you know the essay already uh, or not? The essay is on a book called Mysteries of, Cine, which, Mysteries of Cinema, which is a compilation of all the uh, essays he wrote through the time. So he has one specifically on this, um, work by Tcherkatsky on the, at the entity, so it would be, maybe it would be useful for you. And, well, this is not a question, just um, uh, thinking of cinematic ontology, I was also, we, I was also relating to what we were speaking with Bertolo yesterday, which is, uh, in a way, there's this sort of uh, broad uh, notion of uh, haunting uh, in terms of how in technique it is ingrained the memories of what we've done over the past. So the specificity in a way would be that with radio or the technologies that work with audio or that work with video kind of literalized something that already was in all of the technical objects before. So in a way it's also interesting to think that um, a film can haunt another film uh, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the analog can haunt the presence of certain digital works. And in the broad, broader terms, I think that we are now already there. We are in the, ter in the, in the moment where uh, cinema as a hard form, in a way, haunts several other art forms that come afterwards, like this post-cinema. So this is also very interesting to know that we kind of, uh, 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 that's my opinion, we kind of gain consciousness of the fact through, the f through this particular uh, art and technology combined 
that allow us to listen and to hear and to, to, to watch uh, the presence of people that are not here anymore. But already in texts, we would do this with all the commentaries that come through until 2021, if we read uh, Plato's commentaries. So there's this big line. So this is this very interesting to, to, to have, to also think, um, uh, to also think ghostly, uh, this haunting process in terms of, um, how do you say, uh, um, transmission, which is a kind of trans transmission between generation and people. Um, well, this is uh, one, my, com my, my comment. And the second one, just to, to very briefly to Alice. Um, yesterday we were talking in, about Urich. In the, the Urich talk, we were talking about this uh, how do we sometimes, when faced with very traumatic experiences in humanity, how do we deal with this? Like there's this first moment of big trauma and there's these first images that come, come out and they will come out in the CNN and come out. So they become a sort of first image of the disaster. But then the challenge would be, and we were talking about this yesterday, the challenge would be how do we deal th with this afterwards? Like, to see how can we deal with the, 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 the memory of certain things that we don't want to repeat, so we want to memorize it, and what is the main strategy to, to deal with this. So there's also this uh, very subtle um, chron passing of time, of chronology, which is after this first image pops out, what would be the, 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 the most appropriate strategy? And we are talking about the, that uh, in certain cases, the appropriation of certain images of disaster um, would, uh, in a way, keep this memory with us. But this is so subtle that very quickly we can go through, I think you were addressing, which is not trying to make the traumas ourselves and present all the time to, to, to actually not repeat it, but at the same time not fall into this idea of commodification and into this uh, um, uh, ruined porn or the, this idea of doing tourism into spaces that once, that now could be acknowledged as farces but once were tragedies, yeah? So this, this really uh, temporal, this is a temporal line between acti uh, activism and the way we want to appropriate things to, not, to be able to not repeat the, the same mistakes, but also try to not fall in this idea that once we've been, we look at things with a certain distance, we try to devaluate and we try to, to make it into a pop commodification. So this also this, so it's more, more of a comment also. Uh, thank you, Carlos. I don't know if uh, any of you would like to comment. Uh, thank you for the uh, reference. I will look for it. I, I, don't, I don't know this text. It, it, it interested me a lot. And about the, the idea of a memory of knowledge that is always being actualized or re-actualized in the, in the present, uh, I think it's Erica Balson that uh, says that cinema now, uh, the 20th century cinema, is now becoming um, going inside a museum and becoming a piece of art. Now it's becoming more a philosophy of, of image rather than the original um, experience, ontological experience of cinema. So. Uh, it's really interesting uh, what you said because I think that's uh, the movement of Tchaikovsky and a lot of experimental filmmakers. They also uh, expose these types of films in galleries and museums. And we, we are now regarding cinema not much as a um, like a, a lone discipline uh, by itself, but rather in a much more expanded. Uh, interdisciplinary with uh, philosophy, arts, and, and it's an inflection in the 21st century. That's what I'm trying to, to research a little bit in my PhD, how it, this, this discourse uh, over ontology of film is uh, shifting in uh, experimental filmmakers mainly. Well, it's more of a philosophy of, of the cinema rather than 
the pure cinema, let's say. So thank you. <laughs> Um, I thank you for the comment. I just wanted to add that I suppose a uh, part of what I tried to do with this is to highlight how um, consciousness of how techniques does not fully is not fully under our control is uh, how that con how this uh, sort of mm, sort of um, I don't want to say aestheticized memory because I, I memory is always aesthetic in some way. Um, but I suppose that the power of this uh, aestheticized memory uh, is works as a sort of cautionary tale in a way, uh, a technical and posthumanist cautionary tale, I suppose, for uh, how we are not. Uh, the masters and commanders of nature. So that's my two cents on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We had one more question over there. Yeah, the, actually my feedback is kind of similar to the one that was already posted, but um, well, first all of the presentations were very uh, thought-provoking, and congratulations. So uh, I knew Cherkasky in Mexico City, uh, I think in 2014, he presented all his works in my university. And I um, just wanted to add that I understand that his approach is very material-based and very into the... Mm, purity of the medium of the of the film but there could be a different approach uh, beyond his own uh, way of producing it because I believe it's very much uh, it's film but it's haunted very much by the di by the digital in in starting even with the idea of the possibility of the medium dying or going extinct uh, because of the digital. So in that sense, it's already haunted by like the presence of the digital, but also aesthetically, the way um, his frames are um, grounded with so many information. To me, it uh, relates to the idea of metadata, which is very um, present in the digital objects, and and so in that sense, I, I don't know if you have any opinions on like how it's a very digital form of filmmaking in a way. And uh, for uh, Alison, uh, I wanted to know if you, because you mentioned object-oriented ontology, and as far as I understand, it poses the possibility of an outside, an outside of mm. like a metaphysics and also like a, to me it's inviting to speculative thought in terms of uh, can we overcome like this uh, maybe totalizing understanding of the world that for example leads to the fetishization of tragedy or, or the normalization of horror in relation to technology. So like my question is, do you believe, well not believe, but do you think uh, there could be an outside of that? And like in relation, for example, with nature, uh, I uh, know a reference that has to do with that, which is a uh, Timothy Morton, Dark Ecology, uh, which talks about unraveling the, like the modern thought or like the, I think he calls it the agricultural um, regime or something like that. So yeah, that, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, I really like your provocation. Uh, I think that 
Tchaikovsky is, in a way, his works is a reflection on digital anxiety. Uh, so it's kind of con contradiction that he he states that he only works with material, but this is a response for the the because of the digital. Uh, there is I've been reading a lot of about iconoclasm, and uh, they, there is this idea that an iconoclast, that it's the ones that doesn't like the, the icons or the images, in a way they fear the, the power of images, that's why they destroy them. So in a way they believe in the force of the image, just like a, as an iconophile. So I think Tcherkaksky, it's in this ambiguous um, place, he fears the digital, but at the same time the digital, it what makes, makes him, him produce. Uh, and Erica Balsam will also uh, say that, that the faith in analog uh, becomes more and more strong with the, the, the advent of digital technology. So uh, I think it's really, um, th that's the point. He has a, a kind of a romantic, um, melancholic, I even used the word mel melancholy in, in my presentation because he romanticized romant romanticize a little bit the, the analog, but I think this, this is a really particular contemporary question uh, and debate, and that's why it, it's so, I think it's so interesting. So, so yes, I, I agree with you. <laughs> Uh, okay, so your question is a little <laughs> hard to answer. Do I believe or do I think that uh, there is an outside? I suppose that is the main uh, the main filtered uh, <laughs> question you are posing me. Uh, I do know Timothy Morton, uh, but I uh, it's only very superficially, so it's very I I, I noted this down. And uh, I suppose in, uh, <laughs> to kind of give you, I mean, I, I don't have a fixed position on this yet. Uh, it's still one of those things, one of those uh, holes in my uh, theory, in my mental structure <laughs> of things. But uh, I suppose uh, in a way, yes, I do. Uh, at least to that concept I presented of Eugene Thacker's uh, world without us and the tension between the world without us and the world for us. Uh, yes, I do believe that there is a certain, uh, that, um, yeah, to, to use Benjamin's uh, expression, uh, technics is something of a mediation between history and nature and that there is such a thing as, uh, and that that, relationship does not exhaust everything that uh, there is. <laughs> Even in technics itself, it does not. Uh, our access, our connections to things, and our knowledge of our connections to things does not uh, exhaust all the possible connections and all the connections that there are. I don't know if that was a good answer to your question. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now a little few minutes uh, over time, so I think it's time for us all to go to lunch, a well-deserved lunch after a very intense morning. Thank you to Barbara, Ines, Elise, and Marina for your uh, presentations. Uh, I believe we will start now at 2.30 uh, with the next keynote speaker, uh, Esther Perrin. So have a nice lunch, and thank you very much.